the idea to have an official history of our, our part in the Korean War really came from precedent. The fact that we'd had official histories of our role in the two world wars, and although Korea was not a war on the same scale, it still was involving seven, several thousand Australians and, and caused several hundred casualties. So it was worth uh, doing some work on. Uh, it had been thought about during the 1960s, the War Memorial, which was the controlling authority for all official histories, was still very busy on the Second World War official history until about 1967. And then they began to look around and say, well, what's the next job, which was obviously Korea. Uh, the director of the War Memorial at that stage was Bill Lancaster. Uh, Bill was a fairly quiet man, not full of initiative and not a, not a driver, but very effective at administration. His deputy, Bill Sweeting, had worked quite a lot on the official history of the Second World War. Bill was more of a driver. He was an old journalist himself. And I think if anyone inside the War Memorial brought this about, it was Bill. However, uh, Bill was only the deputy director, and this was something that required uh, full board approval and indeed some activity by the board in order to get the money from the government to do the work. Uh, I don't know a lot about what transpired at board level during the 1960s, uh, except that by the time I came back from Vietnam uh, and resigned from the army in 1968. One of the board members was M Air Marshal Geoffrey Hartnell. Jeff had been head of the Australian Defence Staff in London while I was a graduate student at Oxford and I got to know him quite well in the period 1963, 64, 65. This was also the time when I was working under the supervision of one of the British official war historians, Professor Norman Gibbs, who was Professor of the History of War at Oxford. Norman did the first volume of the Grand Strategy series of the British official history. And it was through Norman that I came to meet Basil Littlehart, who is, is one of the most dynamic and influential people uh, I've ever uh, encountered. Uh, he did a great deal to, to help me. Uh, he wrote the foreword to my first book, The German Army and the Nazi Party. But through getting to know him in 1964, 65, uh, something clicked and he used to invite me down to his house on the Thames one day a week, usually a Thursday, for about 16 months. And during that time, uh, I, of course, got all his thoughts on what a, a poor job the British official history of the First World War was, uh, because it tended to skate over so many things going wrong. It wasn't uh, inclined to uh, criticise the the British High Command, which in some ways had done an appalling job. And in particular, uh, it completely failed to note the role of the new form of weaponry that Basil Littlehart uh, and General JFC Fuller uh, had been uh, arch apostles of, and this was armoured warfare, Blitzkrieg. Uh, and uh, so that side of the official history uh, in Britain was completely deficient. Through working with Little Heart, I, I could see that official histories were important, but they needed to be written with imagination, independence, and some eye to their future utility. So that made that sensitised me towards the importance of official history. If I hadn't sat alongside Norman Gibbs and Basil Littlehart, I might never have become interested in it. Anyway, uh, I returned from Oxford in early 1966, uh, went off uh, to Vietnam as part of the, uh, the first Australian task force, 66, 67. Uh, and while I was there, uh, I got permission from the army to write a book 
uh, on my battalion's experiences, and that was my second book, Vietnam Task, uh, which uh, was entirely typed up by my wife, and she did the editing of it as well. I did the composition in spare hours uh, when we were on the track in, in Nui Dat. We had a marvellous postal service, and I could do three or four pages in my little green plastic notebook, tear them out, put them in an envelope, address them to her. She'd have them four days later. Uh, she'd type them up, uh, make some changes where she thought necessary on, on points of expression, uh, send them back to me. I'd have them back in about 10 days of, of having written them. So when I got back from Vietnam, just about had the complete book written. Well, that was also continuing to make me say, hey, we have got to have not only an official history of the Korean War, but also of the Vietnam War. Now, how are we going to get a history of the Vietnam War if there's no history of the Korean War? So uh, I did a bit more talking to people. By that stage, uh, uh, Air Marshal Hartnell had come back to Australia, retired, uh, was a very influential member of the War Memorial Board, and he put on a good deal of pressure. Uh, I think he was being helped at the same time um, by Bill Sweet, Sweet. And the, the result was, uh, in 1969, the Council of the War Memorial decided, yes, they would commission a history. Uh, they had evidently lined up their sources of, of support and had the money to em employ a research assistant for me and, <coughs> and provide all the uh, ancillary support that the historian would need. Now, Bill, uh, as to who would do it, Bill had been talking initially with Len Turner, who was head of the Department of History in the Faculty of Military Studies at the Royal Military College. Len had been one of the South African official war historians for the Second World War and had written a very good volume, uh, mainly on the big armoured battles uh, at City Resed and one or two other places in uh, North Africa. Uh, and so he, he was naturally both qualified and inclined to, to take it on. He didn't want to do the whole thing himself. So he spoke to me fairly early in the commissioning of the author process. And I said, yes, I'd love to work with him on this. So we were initially both appointed by the Council of the War Memorial. And a very short time later, it may have been a few weeks or a couple of months, the time of that order, Len came to me and said, Bob, I want to step out and let you do it. Now, why Len took that decision, I'm not quite sure. Uh, <coughs> maybe he'd had some health problems, uh, or maybe he just thought that this was something that I could handle and he would get out of the way and, and do something else, whatever. Um, I still kept my hand up, I was willing to do it, and the War Memorial appointed me in late 1969. Now, during 1969, the Australian National University had been talking to me about coming across and joining their Department of International Relations as a senior fellow, and that would give me most of my time free for research, I thought. Uh, anyway, uh, the university w was on the whole happy that uh, I nominated the official war history as my major research project in my first few years there. Uh, but when I went to the ANU, I hadn't been there very long when Hedley Bull, who was acting head of international relations at, at that point, came to me and asked me if I would take over the headship of the Strategic and Defence Studies Centre from Tom Miller. Tom had just been appointed director of the Australian Institute of International Affairs. And, um, well, uh, I thought about it for a while. My initial inclination was to say no to running the centre because I thought doing that and the official history uh, would just be too much altogether. 
So anyway, I went, went home and talked to Sally about it. And Sally said, well, you ought to think hard about that Again, uh, the ANU probably recruited you with the Strategic and Defence Studies Centre in mind, only they weren't upfront about it. You went ahead on the assumption that they weren't going to ask you to take on uh, a major leadership role and accepted the Korean War history. You better try and see if you can do both. So next morning I went back talked more to Headley Bull and the long and the short of it was that uh, I was appointed to be head of the Strategic and Defence Studies Centre from the 1st of January 1971 and I was uh, appointed official war historian. I was appointed to write the official history of the Korean War from the 1st of January 1970. Um, okay, so the, there I was with these two big res responsibilities um, and I had to sort of juggle my time very carefully. The first thing I had to do was plan the Korean War history. And uh, from my knowledge of the war itself, uh, I had worked out a one volume schema for the whole thing. Uh, but as soon as I got going on the official papers, I began to see that the policy side uh, and the diplomatic side was more important actually than the operational side, because it did involve the, uh, the securing of the ANZUS Treaty. Uh, it involved Australia playing a special role within the British Commonwealth, which by even the 1970s had faded fairly fast but in the 1950s was, was a, a very influential organisation next to the United Nations. And with 16 countries, including India, involved in the United Nations Command Alliance, the Commonwealth had uh, a big role to, to play to stop the whole alliance from flying apart. Anyway, uh, I began work on the documents. First thing I had to do was to make sure that my way was clear uh, for getting access to all the most important papers. So <coughs> I thought the way to start this off is begin at the top and see if there are points of resistance. And I began working through the Cabinet Office. Uh, the Assistant Secretary in charge of the Cabinet Office was Peter Bailey, uh, son of uh, Professor Sir Kenneth Bailey, who was the Chief Legal Advisor to the Department of External Affairs. Peter was wonderfully helpful. Uh, he personally thought that official histories were important and they should be written on the basis of fullest access to, to everything. Uh, and he began to arrange the, the flow of Cabinet papers to me. Uh, cabinet papers not only from when we began uh, to operate in Korea, but back as far as the end of the, of the Second World War, so that I could explain how our defence policy had organised and how the three services came to be structured in the way that they were and what our defence relations with Britain and the United States in particular were. Um, well, that proceeded fairly well, uh, but there was a negative side to it. There was such a lot of interesting stuff that I began to think, I can't fit this into two volumes. I'm going to have to, if it's into one volume, I'm going to have to split it into two. Uh, and that would lengthen out the time scale. So I then had to clear this with the uh, Council of the War Memorial, uh, and they were very understanding and uh, on the whole supportive. I, I didn't have any great problem in working with the Council, except at a few points they wanted me to write a bit faster than I could uh, because of other commitments at, at the university. But uh, I never had any problems in terms of access to material. 
uh, or in vetting. I mean, they, in theory, were uh, the vetting authority, although they did pass it across to the Department of Defence. There were a couple of tricky aspects that Defence had to keep an eye on uh, relating to signals intelligence. Any cables that I used that had had a high security classification that could possibly have been intercepted, say, by the Russians or the Chinese uh, in the 1950s, I could not cite verbatim because it would enable the other side to check whether their decoding was accurate or not. So there were, some, there were a few things like that that I, I could cite the sense of, but I could not uh, cite them verbatim. Uh, as far as sensitive policy matters were concerned, uh, there was no inhibition there. Um, consequently, the vetting process took place fairly quickly and it, it was a relatively easy one for me to, to go through. Volume two was quite a lot easier because it was all at the operational level. Uh, and I did give various chunks of it to people like uh, General Daly, who commanded the 28th Commonwealth Brigade, uh, in which our two battalions served in 1952, and General Wilton, who commanded the brigade in 1953. Uh, and. Uh, the senior naval officer and, and air force officers of their relevant periods. Uh, and again, there were no issues there. So uh, I didn't have it anywhere near the, the sorts of problems that Bean had um, in citing anything to do with the choice of senior commanders or relations with ministers and, and so on. Uh, in fact, it was a bit the other way around. Uh, because the Korean War was so interesting from a political perspective, um, and remember, uh, Australia's main motivation in getting involved in the Korean War was to secure the ANZUS Treaty from the Americans. Um, sure, we were there to do our bit uh, in the name of world order and the uh, credibility of, of the United Nations and so on. But what really drove uh, the policymakers back here in Canberra was Percy Spender and his feeling that he could, could clench the ANZUS Treaty. And I was very lucky because he thought this was so important. He just didn't hold back at all. Uh, I could get access to all of his official papers, I could read them, write what I thought was a, a fair account of what happened, and then give it all to him and get him to go through it and give me his comments and we'd discuss them. I didn't uh, accept everything he said for, for gospel, but we would, we would talk our way through it. Uh, and another great benefit I had uh, was the presence of Sir James Plimsoll. Jim Plimsoll, as he was then during the Korean War, was uh, really the, the leading member of the United Nations Commission on the Unification uh, and Re Reconstruction of Korea. Uh, it was the chief policy body really that linked the UN with the United Nations Command in the field. Plimsoll was tremendously important because he was just so much better than anybody else on the commission and everybody could recognize it. Uh, and he had remained very keenly focused on his experience there and was again glad to help um, with information and checking drafts and, and so on. And he read the whole of volume one, and um, he has, or he had an amazing memory. He would sometimes read a chapter draft and say, well, yes, you got that more or less right, but you missed a cablegram that I dictated on the 27th of March, 1952. Um, it's probably been put in another file to the ones you looked at. So I could then go to external affairs or foreign affairs as they were by then, 
uh, give them the citation. They would root around uh, in their basement and they always found the, the uh, cable that, that I'd missed. And quite often Plim would say, and you'll be able to recognise the cable because it covers one, two, three, four points. And when you actually got the draft, you know, he, he had just about a photographic memory. He, he was a, a truly amazing man. Uh, another person who gave me a great deal of help on the policy side was Alan Watt, uh, Sir Alan Watt. Uh, he was head of the Department of External Affairs uh, from uh, 1951 to 54. So uh, he was right in the thick of it, uh, working on a day-to-day -day basis with, with Percy Spender uh, in daily cable touch uh, with London and, and Washington and Jim Plimsoll in Korea and, and so on. Uh, and at that point, Alan had retired and was working uh, as a visiting fellow in the Department of International Relations at the ANU. So I had ready access to him. Uh, another person who was extremely helpful was Arthur Tang. Uh, formidable man though he, he is, uh, he was also interested in being accurate. And uh, he had succeeded Alan Watt. There were still quite a number of continuing major policy issues over which he had more influence than, than Watt. And so it was good to get uh, his view on, on what I, I wrote. Uh, I had the problem of trying to balance their various comments where they clashed with each other. And these were, were men of all strong personality. Um, it was one of the things that made the job interesting to me, um, but it also made it time consuming. And the first volume took me nine years to write. And by about year five or year six, uh, a couple of the trustees were saying, come on, O'Neill, you know, we, you said you would do this in four years, maybe six. Uh, that time's gone by. We, we want to see something for your efforts. Anyway, um, I was able to convince them that I was actually working as hard as I could. And I was helped in that process by the chairman of the Research and Publications Committee of the War Memorial, Professor Brian Gandivia. Brian had the, had the job uh, of being the direct interface between the council and myself. And when there'd been a council meeting, I would say, get home at half past five afterwards, the phone would ring and it would be Brian. And he'd be giving me a readout on what the council had been saying about progress on the Korean war history. Sometimes it was pleasant, sometimes it wasn't pleasant, but you know, that, there we go, that's, that's real life. But because it, it was clearly moving ahead uh, and I was getting the approval of the principal actors involved uh, in the whole policy drama, uh, the War Memorial uh, stepped back and said, okay, uh, I also, after uh, the sixth year on the project, I refused all further payment too, so it wasn't costing them anything for me. Uh, I was being paid at something like 25% of my ANU salary, which fitted in with ANU regulations. Um, the other costs they, they had to meet were research assistants. Uh, I had one research assistant, uh, Daryl McIntyre, for about seven years. Daryl started with me in late 71, and then he went through till about 78, and then Jeff Williams came along, and Jeff stayed with me uh, while I finished off Vol 2. And uh, as you know, I was appointed to the International Institute for Strategic Studies in London uh, in August of 1970, 1982. Uh, I finished drafting Vol 2 in either late 81 or early 82. Um, and as it was time 
for it to begin the the editing process and Jeff did quite a lot of work from that perspective and there was uh, a lady in the government publishing service whose name is in the acknowledgements uh, of Vol 2. I'm, I'm just blanking on what it is now, but she really took charge of seeing it through the press, uh, you know, the, the page layouts and how the fold-out maps were done and, and so on. They were things that, that she handled. Um, but uh, it, it was a, a very complex volume uh, from a production perspective and uh, I suspect it was expensive uh, on a per volume cost to the War Memorial. They only had a certain amount of money so they commissioned a small print run and you know, it, it sold out very quickly because it was the volume of the two that all the veterans wanted and so they could have sold several thousand but I'm sure they didn't have that number printed. On the question of the, uh, the involvement I got from the Korean War veterans, uh, I have to say that it was very patchy. And the main reason for this, after talking to people, was that it was so far behind them. I, I was seeking interviews with people who'd been uh, patrol leaders and uh, platoon commanders and, and so on 25 years ago and they had to scratch their heads really to, to think what their experiences were, what was worth recording and, and what wasn't. And um, I was lucky in that having been a cadet at Duntroon in the mid 50s, quite a lot of my instructors, there are people like Russell Lloyd uh, or David Thompson had been platoon commanders or company commanders, um, won military crosses uh, for their work, uh, and they were, they'd become personal contacts. And when I was writing the official history, I could get in touch with them, and they were very helpful. Uh, they would read the drafts in detail, they would give me interviews. Um, and, and write letters and so on. That side of it was all right, but getting the sort of mass input that Bean was able to get because he was alongside the guys in, in the trenches uh, and on the hillsides of, of Gallipoli and so on, I, that, that was a deficiency uh, in my retinue. So ha having realized that, I began to say to Jeff Hartnell uh, on the War Memorial Council, you've got to do something about getting the Vietnam experience recorded. He took the point and the Army appointed uh, a Lieutenant Colonel, uh, I'm just blanking on his name at the, at the moment. Ian McNeil? Sorry, who? Ian? Ian McNeil? No. No? Um, Morrison. Ian Morrison. Oh. Uh, anyway, he was uh, sent up to Vietnam with a small team, I think in early 1961, early 1971, and I went up and visited him a month or two after just to see how it was going and to talk to him more about what was important in battalion and task force uh, war diaries and and so on, so that he could give them a push in a more interesting direction. And, and that worked quite well. And then uh, Ian McNeil retired from the army in what, the mid 70s. Um, and of course, he'd done graduate uh, university work in, in history, and uh, he was well qualified to, to take charge of the the proper assembly of, of material that I, I simply didn't have because too much time had elapsed between the war and when I was writing. Yes, th there were a couple of very tricky areas that I had to think about a good deal uh, to work out how I would uh, tell, tell the story. Uh, and one 
was the role that Wilfred Burchett played vis-à-vis uh, -vis our prisoners of war in North Korean and Chinese hands. I was very lucky in having a personal contact with uh, one of the most senior of the Australian prisoners, Captain Phil Greville. By the time uh, I was working with him, he was Brigadier Greville and uh, just about retired. But anyway, Phil was a very studious man, um, very intelligent. He'd been instructor in engineering while I was a cadet at Duntroon. And then he'd been on the Australian Army staff in Australia House, London, uh, during my time in Oxford. So I'd kept that connection with him and uh, so I used to see him fairly regularly. And of course, once I had been commissioned to do the Korean War history, <clears throat> he came forward and offered me his help. And he was able to talk about it so vividly and it was, it was cl clearly one of the, the major events in his life. Uh, I thought, again, following precedent established in earlier war histories, I would just invite him to write a chapter on uh, his experiences. Now, Phil uh, was not inclined to be charitable towards Wilfred Burchett, the journalist who had decided to side with the Chinese and the North Koreans. Burchett uh, is a an ob object of great controversy here. He does have his admirers. I have to say, having heard a lot about what he did during the, the Korean War, I am not one of them. Because he used to do things like turning up to uh, talk to a group of American Air Force people who'd been shot down, holding letters from their wives, which he would wave in front of them and then not pass them out. Uh, and he would do similar things to Australians. Well, uh, as Phil says in, in the uh, chapter he's done, there, there was a time when a, a number of Australian prisoners made little wooden fingers, figures with nooses around their necks that they held out in front of Birchett. And of course, Birchett went, th went through the roof and some people suffered very brutal punishments as a result. But that, that's, that's the kind of guy he was. And it's no wonder the government declared him persona non grata and took his passport away uh, until the mid-1970s. Anyway, um, <clears throat> I did have to rely on Phil's first-hand experience. There were other prisoners I could have gone to, but Phil was just much more articulate, um, much more into the way of writing things down uh, than the others were, so that's why I uh, chose him to do that. Um, now, as we got towards uh, publication of the volume, I could see that there were some uh, things in that chapter that might cause legal problems. So uh, I went to the Attorney General's department and said, will my um, <coughs> indemnity as official historian cover um, what Brigadier Greville has written? And they said no. Uh, so I talked uh, to them a little harder and got nowhere. I went and talked to Phil and said, well, uh, how does this affect you? Do you want to pull out? Do you want to change? anything and he said no he said this he said this guy Birchett uh, deserves to have his story told by someone who was seriously affected by it he said he would take the risk well uh, I think I went then went to Jeff Hartnell again and with his help and advice uh, we talked to some other senior people in attorney generals and, and got the sort of understanding that wasn't quite what I wanted in black and white, but they said they wouldn't let me down uh, if uh, a battery of lawyers came at me on, on Birchett's behalf. So there was that slight uh, element of uncertainty. Uh, Phil was not fully covered, but 
he just felt so strongly about it that he was going to run that risk. And you know, that's the basis of good history. I was just delighted that uh, he took that point of view. Well, uh, with, with different reactions, uh, there were some people like Bruce Miller, uh, who had written a good deal of diplomatic history himself. He was the head of my department most of the time. He was very helpful. Hedley Bull, uh, who was head of the department in, well, Bruce was away in 1970 and had to handle an initial wave of criticism at someone from the ANU doing this kind of dirty official work. Um, Headley had been in the Department of International Relations at the London School of Economics and he said there were always people working on official history jobs, you know, it was, it was just not a big deal. We had economic historians, we had diplomatic historians. <coughs> We had military historians, it's, so he said, oh, don't worry. <coughs> he said, don't, don't worry, um, I'll back you, uh, and he did. But the, the first problem we encountered was the then director of the Research School of Pacific Studies, Oscar Spate. Oscar was uh, an old lefty, um, he, he was a good man in many ways. I later developed a, a fairly warm relationship with him. But Oscar saw this as part of an official takeover and infringement on the university's uh, independence. What he didn't know was the tradition that Bean and Long had built up, whereby the government only had control over the <clears throat> the parts that really affected the security of current day policies and, and issues. Uh, and that what appears in, in Bean's and, and Long's histories in the final analysis is their judgment. And um, Alan Watt, from a few doors down the corridor, was able to put this uh, point of view to Oscar and he sort of backed off, but I, I could tell uh, that I was not flavour of the month for, for quite some time. And uh, this really meant that uh, I was not able to uh, go to the university and ask for some financial support for uh, another research assistant, which meant I had to be totally dependent on the War Memorial. The War Memorial, in those days had very little money. And uh, so the best they could do for me was one research assistant. Uh, and as you know, that was Daryl, then Jeff. And uh, so those guys uh, were worked quite hard, but they were, they were champion uh, researchers and I had no trouble with them. And you know, the, an, an awful lot of what is in the book was material they dredged out, out of the files. I was not able to read everything uh, ab initio. I was able to, I, I, I picked out the most important files and, and read them myself, but there was an awful lot that they went through and they would then give me copies or, or digests and I would uh, weave them into a chapter. Uh, I just wanted to add a, a lighter note uh, to the, uh, the degree of access I had to official documents. When I had to do all the Defence Committee minutes and the Defence Minister's papers and, and so on, I reported to uh, Defence Headquarters. They took me up and they took me out into their sec top secret registry and gave me a desk and a chair and said, it's yours. <laughs> so I could go anywhere I, I liked and pull down anything that was of interest to me. I was too busy actually to read stuff other than the Korean War, but I could listen to the conversations that were going on around me. And the people who 
push trolleys along corridors with documents are, are not just zombies. They are very interested in the policy process, uh, like the people who are involved in it. And they're reading the files, and uh, I can remember sitting at my desk and someone would say, hey, you should see what Fraser is writing to Gorton. This is red hot stuff. <laughs> now, how far that went amongst their own circle, I don't know, but uh, it, it was really quite amusing. Yeah. Now, I w the, the help I received from the uh, other principal allied nations was, was quite appreciable. Let me start with the most important, and that was Britain. Because we were part of the Commonwealth and all of the diplomacy of our involvement in the Korean War was either on a by agreement or a by notification basis with Britain, uh, there was a lot of to and fro that I I had to get hold of. And a lot of those documents were still uh, British documents rather than Australian. So I had to get permission from the relevant British government authorities, both to access them and to cite them. And uh, I was very, very lucky one uh, day in 1972, a senior official from the Ministry of Defence happened to be in Canberra for a meeting that related to the defence of Malaysia and, or it was, yes, Malaysia and uh, it wasn't CETO, but it was the Southeast Asian area. Uh, and I refer to him uh, in the acknowledgements too. Uh, it was just a very lucky meeting because you know he was a kind of another Jim Plimsoll. Uh, he, he believed in history and that it should all be spelled out. And I said I was coming to London next year to, for a, a year's work. Could he help me with access? He said, sure. He said, just write me a list of, of what you want and I'll make inquiries in the next few months and see if there are any sticking points. Uh, so he did. And when I got to, to London, I began working with mid-level people and very soon found there were all kinds of sensitivities. So I went to this guy whose name I think was Brian. Anyway, I'm, I'm just blanking on that. But anyway, I went back to him, explained that there was a problem and you know, bingo, two weeks later there was no problem. Uh, I was just very lucky in being able to go to resourceful people who supported the cause of good, free, detailed, open, open history. Um, and from that precedent, I was then able to work my way through the, the two services that uh, really involved us, the Army and the Navy. The Brits were not involved in the air side of the Korean War. Um, and uh, the naval contingent was, was quite strong. It was the British Pacific Fleet uh, commanded by a rear admiral, and I was able to interview the rear admirals uh, who were responsible. They were still surviving. And I was lucky enough to be able to interview the various commanders of the 1st Commonwealth Division, uh, like Field Marshal Sir James Castles uh, and uh, General Mike West. Uh, and when I could interview people at that level, you, you could get more of a perspective on what the significance of the Australian contribution was. You know, was it terribly important? Was it so small that it was negligible? Um, in what ways uh, should I, as a historian, record their efforts, etc. Et and uh, out of that, uh, I, th I think I got a, a better structure um, uh, of the three arms, of the two armed services parts where we uh, collaborated closely with the Brits. Um, on the US side, uh, again, because we were part of the three main United States services, uh, 
Navy, Army and Air, not, not the Marines, of course. Um, I needed to get access to their historians and, and some documents. The Americans are, are a much more bureaucratic country than we are. Uh, they're much bigger, of course. Uh, they do their official histories really on a single service basis. There is a big army history team, navy history team, an air history team, and they are dotted around Washington. So I had to go there, talk to the authors of the various volumes, which had come out a, a decade, or in some cases, 15 years earlier. But uh, again, they were they were helpful, but it had its limits because there was nothing that really was uh, doing what I was intending to, to do with volume one, uh, which was a pity because I would have loved to have been able to get uh, a State Department historian's view on that crucial meeting between Spender and Truman on the 13th of September 1950, where Truman says, OK, I'll give you an alliance, <laughs> uh, because Dean Acheson was dead against it. How they sorted that out between them uh, would have been great to have had the inside story on, but I couldn't, couldn't do that. Um, the other group of people who were very helpful were the South Koreans, not so much from the point of view of access to documents, I don't read any Korean, uh, and I think they would have been altogether less liberal, but in terms of being taken around. Um, I had a small team of people led by a Lieutenant Colonel in the Korean Army, who's again in the acknowledgements to, to Volume 2, um, and we walked uh, up a uh, hill 504, uh, where the, the Battle of Kapyong took place around. We walked along as, as much of the old Jamestown line uh, as we could get access to. We weren't able to get on top of Hill 355, which dominated uh, where the Commonwealth Division was in uh, late 1951, 52, 53. That was uh, in um, the, the so-called demilitarised zone. Uh, I did go into the demilitarised zone a couple of times um, with a South Korean patrol. They, there was an arrangement whereby both the North Koreans and the South Koreans were able to patrol and, I suppose, get some confidence that they were not about to be overwhelmed by a bunch of people who were building up there. Anyway, um, that enabled me to walk over some of the important ground, take photos and so on. And they were also able to take me underground. The North Koreans uh, had done a lot of tunnelling under the demilitarised zone. And the South Koreans uh, had super listening equipment and they could work out where the digging was and they would dig a counter tunnel. And when they went into the, the North Korean tunnel, the, the North Koreans would realise that their cover was blown and they would, they would run out. Sometimes <clears throat> they had built a concrete barrier uh, some way up the tunnel, with, which just had a, a hole in, in it that they could, could squeeze through. Uh, and perhaps another hole a little higher up the wall that they could put a weapon on and they could uh, perhaps put a, a spotlight on and, and fire at anyone approaching. But uh, there was nothing as exciting as that when, when I went down. But it, it just is surprising to see. And of course, as the Chinese were such great excavators during the Korean War itself, I mean, they, a lot of their uh, weapon pits and so on had two layers beneath them for ammunition and food and sleeping shelters and, and so on. Gave me uh, an idea that I would not have otherwise had. Um, now, oh, just to go back to British 
people who who helped me. Um, one of Britain's most famous soldiers from the Korean War was Captain, later General Sir Anthony Farrah Hockley, uh, who had been a prisoner of the North Koreans. He'd escaped twice, if not three times, and been recaptured. Um, I had gotten to know him through the International Institute for Strategic Studies, uh, but <coughs> as soon as he heard that I was doing the Australian history uh, in the early 70s, he got in touch with me. Um, the Brits were very slow to commission an official history, um, but he began putting a little pressure on at the London end, and so did a few other people. And um, during the 1970s, he was appointed to write uh, the British official, official history, which um, went, it kept him busy for oh, 10 or 15 years. And <clears throat> again, we would exchange drafts and comments and, and so on. That was, that was a, a great asset to have. And uh, we became personal friends when I was at Oxford. He lived just about 20 miles down the Thames. Uh, we used to see each other socially. Quite a bit sadly, he's dead now. One, one major regret I have about the official history of the Korean War was that the print of volume two was so small. So there were so few volumes printed. It sold out very quickly and people have told me that for years and years. Uh, I have only two copies of Vol 2 left. You know, there have been such deserving cases coming along that I've given out my small stock. Um, and there aren't any spares, <laughs> I've discovered. And uh, you know, I would love to see the War Memorial uh, as a further act of commemoration uh, of a, uh, a war which uh, is now long behind us if they would uh, commission a, a reprinting of the second volume. Uh, interleaving of the political, diplomatic and strategic sides of our policy. In a way, it's, it's a recognition that Australia is growing up and had already gone some distance down that track after the Second World War. You can say, all right, our involvement in the First World War was as a fragment of the British Empire. Our involvement in the first three years of the Second World War, again, was as part of the British Empire. And then we became part of the big American-led alliance of the Pacific. And then we were sort of on our own. And we began to grapple our way towards independence uh, with the Labour Party's foreign and defence policies of the late 1940s, which is why I thought it was important to include that part in uh, the Korean War history. And then uh, you can see during the Korean War itself the role that Spender plays, the role that Plimsoll plays, uh, the role that uh, the, the various service leaders play uh, on, the, on the scene uh, uh, during the war itself. We were not just a fragment of the, of the British Empire after all. And we had our own policy objectives. Uh, we had our own uh, different ways of interacting uh, in all of these spheres. They're very consequential and they deserve to be studied. Well, one of the deficiencies I found when working on the Australian records of the Korean War is that quite a lot of the key papers that were written by Australians, and here I, I mean the war diaries of the 28th Commonwealth Brigade, which was commanded by Brigadier, later General Sir Thomas Daly, and then uh, Brigadier, later General Sir, Sir John Wilton. They're all in London. Um, and indeed, some of the, the Australian battalion 
records. I don't know whether that is still the case, but I can remember complaining at the time, and certainly uh, Air Vice Marshal Hartnell supported the case. So I think that would be worth following up and putting some pressure on. My, my bet is that it's all still over there, uh, and we really ought to repatriate a, lo a lot of these records. And I think the same applies to shared diplomatic uh, and uh, strategic planning documents. I hope uh, that during the Vietnam War, um, <coughs> full sets were kept in Australia and, and not parked in Washington. When I was uh, first being approached <coughs> as to whether I would uh, help with writing the Korean War official history, uh, I felt a lot of confidence in the system because Bean and, and Long had established a clear way for uh, serious historians to proceed through the mass of official documents uh, and be able to produce work that was not obviously government propaganda, uh, which you can't say was the case in uh, several other countries that I could name but won't. Um, and that tradition uh, had been taken on board by the Australian historiographical community and it was there, it was available to me, I felt, if I got into trouble. I could say, hey, uh, the government is not following the precedents that were established in the two World War series. Now, as, as it happened, I need not have worried because people kept out of my way. Uh, part of the, the reason for this is that the Korean War was 25 years in, in the past when I was working on a lot of it. And uh, it, it had gone out of people's memories. It was, it was not a, a political uh, hot button. Uh, <clears throat> obviously not the case with the Vietnam official history and Peter Edwards had different problems of his, of his own there to handle. But uh, yes, I was, I was def definitely supported by the traditions that Bean and Long had, had established uh, and uh, reinforced by the number of people who respected what they'd done. Well, um, writing the operational history of our role in the Korean War was quite a challenge because we operated as three separate services under foreign command uh, and the force components that we sent were appreciable but not huge. They could be easily lost uh, on, on the battlefield. So what I had to, to do with each of the, the three contingents was first, first of all uh, to treat them separately because our Air Force rarely supported our Army, uh, the Navy even rarer. They did operate uh, well, well apart. Um, and I also had to make sure that the reader had some introduction to the big picture for air, the big picture for uh, the war at sea, the big picture for the war on land uh, every now and then. So uh, if you look at the contents list for Vol 2, you'll see that there are some what I would call grand strategy chapters or in other if it's not the full chapter, it might be the first five pages where that was uh, enough to cover it and, and then the detail of, of the operations. Uh, and I just, again, on the operational history, decided not to repeat uh, similar operations in detail. Uh, make sure that all the operations were covered in detail at least once and then pick operations in which individuals had done something that was worthy of, of record and, and going on to 
future generations. So you'll find uh, all the all the major medal winners are, are covered.